I grew up in Bathurst, New South Wales, until I was 19 years of age. I had a wonderful childhood. You had Granny Sinclair, you had everything. She was a, a lady who was way ahead of her years, and today I often wish she was with me so I could thank her. I've never had a smack in my life, never once. Teaching me, she used to lecture me, often wishing the lecture was a smack in the bottom instead, but she do it in a certain way that you didn't even know that she was teaching you. But she had a very, very strict idea of raising children. First seven years was the most important years of their life. And seven till 14, you taught them how to think for themselves and do things around the house and to think of other things. And then at 14, you taught them to think of other people as well as yourself. And that was the most important one. And she was very good at that. that when, uh, when I was uh, 14, my uh, foster mother died. My foster father had died when I was four and a half. And so I was all women, there's no men, there's five women to teach me. And I had a wonderful uh, girlhood. And then came the war. It was said that the girls could now join the forces, providing they were old enough. Uh, uh, I think 20, 19 was the age to join the forces if they were wanted to. So I decided I was going to do it at the Air Force. Well, I, did, I didn't really know what I was doing. I've, I wanted to go into it, but I don't know why I wanted to go into it. It was just, just something that sort of drew you towards it. I don't know. I think it was just something else to do, something, another challenge. I, I, I was very fond on these things, doing something that I knew I couldn't do. So I think that's possibly what it was. But the funny part of it was, I wanted to go into signals. And I had to look back on that because before that, I was in the guides and I was a patrol leader. And one of the girls wanted to get her signals badge. And to have the signals badge, you have to have Morse code uh, alphabet, be able to read the Morse code, uh, code alphabet. And I thought, oh, how the heck can I do that? How can I get to that alphabet? And I thought, oh, the radio man, he might be able to help because we a house, and now we lived down to a smaller house because the old people had died. And uh, on either side, there was a boarding house for men. And the uh, new announcer used to live in one of the boarding houses. So I thought I'd ask him. And so I did, and he was a young chap. And he says, oh, yes, I could help you there. He says, I'm a ham. I thought, good Lord, what's a ham? That's the thing you hang up in the laundry in the Christmas time. And then he explained what a ham was. Radio operator, experimental radio. And uh, so he taught me the, the alphabet. And not only that, he had the key and everything, because he, when he went off the air of a, an evening, he used to get onto his ham station and get all the stations overseas until they were stopped as they were after the war had been going a year or so. And uh, so I was uh, quite familiar with that. So I, I'm going to join the Air Force and I'm going to be in signals. So then I had to go down to Sydney to do a uh, test to make sure I could make new my dashes from my dots. I got through that all right. And so I ended up uh, as a WT operator in RAAF. Ascot Vale in Melbourne. We did our training there, and we'd go out under a little viaduct. We were out on the uh, Flemington race course, and there was a little railway turn off there. And we could do our PE, or what we called it, on the uh, platform there every day. But we hoped and prayed that the train didn't come past because it was going or coming from the abattoirs, and it was so smelly. And we used to have our handkerchiefs right across our nose there and with chin strap on either side. But it was good fun. We had our uh, PE training, which was very good. And we could had our own special little bits of time to ourselves. And we wanted a cup of cocoa or something. We had our powdered milk and uh, a little kerosene, uh, not kerosene, the methylated spirits contraption that we put the we lit that up, we put the, uh, had a frame on it, and we put our billy can on that and boiled it up and made some cocoa. And then with the coffee and the powdered milk, we were all right. 
or oh, the condensed milk. We couldn't always get the condensed milk though. Sometimes if we had weekend, we, weekends, we'd go uh, to one of the girls' places that take us home to one of the posts. I used to go to Mrs. Simpson Sadie. It was Sadie Martin, I think her name was. And uh, we'd have the weekend away for, for a change every now and then. But uh, uh, then, then we got our, uh, had our exams. If you got through, lucky enough to get through them, we got posted. I got posted to uh, Rathmines up near Newcastle. And we had a, a quite a good time up there because we could get down to the ocean. And we'd go there. We'd, had, uh, we'd put on our outside you, the uniform was a surge material. And to dry clean it, we used to go up to the beach and get into the damp sand. <laughs> and it used to work. Clean them beautifully. I'd like to see something in our government that would give teenagers, 15 to 17, a certain amount of time each year and a training course, like we had with the Air Force. That training can make or break you. I've seen men go away as boys and come back as, back as men. Just for the, when they had the, the tra training at one stage, they had compulsory training, I think it was six months. And I've seen boys that were around the corner from us, and one boy himself said he went away a boy and came back a man, which is, was true too. And I'd like to see that to happen with our kids. So we had some lovely friends, really nice friends. I, I lost about four or five good friends. And uh, I still think about it, give it a lot of thought, what might have been. But uh, one English family were very good. To the, they lost, lost people back in England. And I think, I think that hit me more than anything. To see them so sad and broken up about what was going on. That was, uh, I think it was, just, we're a funny lot, we're uh, feared, the feeling, oh, well, that's happening, we've got to, we've got to Get on and do what we can about it. Well, good morning, friends. It's lovely to have you all here for our Anzac service today. Let's start our time with a prayer. O oh, great God, ruler of the universe, Thank you for the freedoms we enjoy in Australia and for those who lay down their lives to defend them. Help us be grateful for their sacrifice, remember their courage and labour to preserve the peace we enjoy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I'll now invite Linda Morley to bring an introduction to us as well as an acknowledgement of coming. I'd like to show um, my respect today and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Darug people, the elders past and present on which this meeting takes place today. So I welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our Anzac Day ceremony. Anzac Day is a special and important day for all Australians and New Zealanders. On the 25th of April, every year we come together to honour and remember those who fought and died in our countries and endeavour to keep alive the spirit of our Anzacs. In 1915, Australia and New Zealand were young nations and World War I was a chance for them to prove themselves on the world stage. When the British Empire's call for volunteers came, it was met with much enthusiasm by Australians and New Zealand young men and thousands enlisted, some still only in their teens. Fatefully, the landing of the troops went terribly wrong and a bitter and tragic battle ensued. The troops displayed an immense amount of courage, 
and compassion <coughs> and valued above all mateship. These qualities became known as the Anzac spirit and this spirit is etched forever in our hearts and our minds. It has been argued that what was a great sacrifice for our countries was simultaneously a gift of national identities. For the two young countries, the mark of courage, respect and equality, compassion and loyalty, endurance and bravery of their young men united them more than the Federation itself. Australians and New Zealands today continue to fight in other conflicts in far off lands to defend our shared values and common interests for their past and current operations around the world we honour them. Well, friends, we're going to have our first hymn, the hymn, Abide With Me.
very happy to be here to uh, read out a poem in Finance Fields. In Finance Fields, the poppy flows between the crosses, row on row, that marks our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly scarce, heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunsets glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from fair hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. In Flanders fields we perform. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I, I thought I was the, the, the uh, driver of the car to bring my wife up to play the piano. <laughs> I'm now the guest speaker, so that's quite a promotion. Rather than talk about the war, I might tell you about my experience as a young fellow who went to the war. When the war broke out, I was in boarding school, and the headmaster, who was a World War I veteran, was very warlike. He told all his students you know, what a great job he'd done in World War I. And of course, when World War II broke out, he told us we all have to go to the war. I was only about a bit over 14 when the war broke out in 1939. And probably, looking back, my main worry was the war was going to be over before I could get to it. That wasn't so. Over the first two years of the war, many of our students, ex-students, who joined up, were over in Africa fighting. One of them, John Edmondson, won the Victoria Cross. And of course, he was the first Victoria Cross awarded in World War II to children Australia. So that again was quite an incentive. So I, I left school in 1941 and started work at Queen Mary. My, my manager was an ex-World War person, World War I, and of course that helped. He suggested and I agreed to join the local volunteer defence school. Now the RSL had started up this home guard in 1939, and it ended up with about 50,000 old World War I diggers and a few youngsters like me uh, by 1942 who were able to replace some of the younger troops in the fixed defences and the ACAC guns and the, uh, the coastal artillery. So the, the World War I people had this second go at uh, I, I had the privilege of serving with an ANZAC uh, veteran. The CO of that Volunteer Defence Corps unit actually served at Gallipoli and Gairo. And the other interesting thing I can remember, the Sergeant Major for our Saturday and Sunday parade was uh, a veteran of the British Army, I, I think the Guards, and he used to bark these orders and marches around, on our route marches around the place, uh, as if he was still in the home guard, at the Royal Guard. The uh, Australian Defence Forces weren't very well organised in those days, as far as we were concerned. We didn't have uniforms. We were issued with ball war rifles, carbines, but we were taught to throw hand grenades, which came very useful to me when I got up to the New Guinea. When I was 18, I shipped off to the Sydney uh, showground, uh, medically examined, and then marched to a recruit training battalion at Cowra. We lined up about a couple of hundred recruits that morning, and uh, the sergeant major said, anybody with previous experience take two steps forward. Three or four of us stepped forward. Once, other than me, were questioned, where did you get your experience? And one 
bloke said, oh, when I was 15, I was in to Brooklyn. And so I went, and they came to me, what have you been doing, son, to say you've had experience? Well, I've had a couple of years in the Volunteer Defence School. They accepted that, and after a short time, I was sent to a battalion in Sydney. I thought, well, this is pretty good, except we were used as wharf labourers for about three months. And we were loading ammunition on American uh, victory vessels, I think they used to call them, very heavy. Uh, 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 after a sh short spell of that, uh, we were sent down to Cowra, where, where the Japanese prisoners had broken down. And we were, uh, we were told to move them out to Hay Prisoner of War Camp, a couple of hundred of them. And we set off in this very long convoy of trucks, the Japanese on the back, uh, through the dustiest conditions imaginable for very few hard uh, roads in those days. And the poor old prisoners on the back of these eight trucks, of course, copped a fair bit of dust. So then off to New Guinea, and uh, I joined the, uh, an infantry battalion, the 58th, 59th battalion, uh, which uh, had the distinction of never losing a battle in World War II. We lost a lot of casualties, but we didn't lose a battle. Some of you may remember the, the Volunteer Defence Corps uh, in the early part of the war. You've certainly seen the uh, TV series uh, about the, the British Home Guard and uh, a, a, a memory of that is our weekend job was guarding the War Memorial at Canberra. We were at Glendale. But also a very secretive wireless station at Harman, a naval wireless station. And the old First World War blokes were very pleased about that because the people who men that naval wireless station were RANS, W-R-A-N-S, Women's Royal Australian Navy Service. And uh, of course the old blokes thought they were doing a lot of it. But I don't think that was so. <laughs> I, I could tell you about fighting and the rest of it, but I, I don't think that's necessary. Uh, the main thing uh, about how a young bloke uh, Got experience before he was 18 to join the infantry battalion in World War II. Thank you. We're going to have our Bible reading now, and Joy Edmonds, one of our residents, is going to read the Bible for us. And the Bible reading is from John. Chapter 15, verse 9 to verse 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remained in his life. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give it to you. 
This is my command. Love each other. Thank you, Joy. Well, I'm going to invite Lieutenant Colonel Grant Dibton, who's the Senior Chaplain, Chaplain of the 2nd Division in the Australian Army, to give our sermon. Thank you, Grant. Well, thanks, Matt. It's a, it's a wonderful privilege to come out and to be able to share with you uh, on Anzac Day. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous day for uh, in our calendar in Australia, and so it's a wonderful delight to be able to share with that. So Anzac Day <coughs> commemorates a great defeat, doesn't it? And it seems strange, doesn't it, to, uh, uh, that Australia's most hallowed day in the military remembering uh, doesn't recall a great victory. Why is that? Why do we think about our defeat rather than our victory? I mean, basically every other nation that you can think of commemorates one of their great victories. So why doesn't Australia? And it's not because there's a lack of great victories, as we heard from David earlier. His battalion was not defeated in the war. We can, uh, we can think about how the Australians uh, have a very, a very long list of wonderful military achievements. In, in World War II, we were the first nation, really, to stop the previously unstoppable Germans. Uh, we stopped them at Tobruk. We stopped the Japanese uh, who had bombed Pearl Harbor, who had knocked over the Philippines, who had moved down through the Malaysian Peninsula, had overrun Singapore, landed in New Guinea, and the Australians stopped them at Mill Bay. Perhaps the strongest candidate to remember a victory to celebrate happened in October 1917 at Beersheba where 800 Australian Light Horsemen from the 4th Light Horse Brigade made a mounted charge across three kilometres of open ground against 4,000 entrenched infantrymen with artillery and machine gun support. <coughs> the Turkish soldiers were so unnerved by the sheer audacity, really, of the Australian troops that in their haste they didn't wind the guns down fast enough in the artillery, they didn't lower their sights, and so most of the shots went over the heads of the Australians as they charged. We only lost 31 people out of 800, 36 were wounded, and we captured over 700 troops of the Turks. And that really turned around much of the war, and it, it opened up the way uh, for us to, the, the Allies to go back and take uh, Jerusalem and move through there. But not even that is our most hallowed day. No, our most hallowed day is a day of remembrance. It recalls our great defeat where we lost 8,700 8, soldiers on the peninsula of Gallipoli. Just under 20,000 were wounded. They were young men by and large. The vast majority who were killed between the ages of 18 and 24. All in a few months. It's really difficult to imagine how the nation coped with such a, a huge loss. Because when we think about what happens today, even the loss of a single Australian soldier uh, sees a funeral attended by a whole range of politicians right from the Prime Minister down. So why? Why is the defeat at Gallipoli, why has that become nation shaping? Why is it that we Aussies are notoriously irreverent? Why do we actually become reverent and revere in many senses and commemorate the defeat that was Gallipoli? Well, I think it's because Gallipoli symbolises for us the qualities of courage in the face of great adversity, of, of reckless valour in a good cause or of endurance that will never admit defeat, as the war historian Charles Bean wrote. Gallipoli symbolises caring for your mates and sacrifice, as we heard in our introduction. That's what we respect. That's what we value. The honour, the courage, the selflessness, the sticking at it to get the job done under harrowing circumstances, the personal sacrifice. 
And so on Anzac Day, we remember them. And we remember the over 100,000 Australians who have died from various wars, right from World War I, to World War II, to the Malaysian, the Malaysian emergency, to Korea, to Vietnam, to Iraq, and Afghanistan, and East England. Their blood trodden into the mud of foreign lands and the heartbreak of their families and friends. And we should be grateful. We should be a grateful nation. And while we don't glorify war, we certainly do remember the sacrifice of those who went before us because there is something noble about sacrifice, isn't there? And the sacrifice of Jesus is still at the centre and the symbolism of Anzac Day with its crosses for the fallen, with its sacrificial language, with the reverence. But Jesus' sacrifice is really on a different level. You see, Jesus was God in the flesh, for whom the Bible says, and by whom all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him, the Bible says. And it's that Jesus who died for you. He died to bring you personally into a relationship with him. To be reconciled to him, the creator of the universe. Not to know about him, but to know him personally. We've thought a lot about death today as we remember the fallen. Death is something we all face, isn't it? I think humanity instinctively knows that this life isn't all there is. We talk of departed loved ones looking down on us. The media talks of that. A number of headstones in Gallipoli have this idea that one reads, our dear son, lost his life to find it. Another, not goodbye, but good night. The Christian message is that death is not the end of the story. It's a powerful balm to the jolting finality of standing next to a grave. The grave isn't the last word in what it means to be human. We can live without the suffering and without death and we can live with Jesus forever and eternity. Just over a hundred years ago at Gallipoli, thousands of people gave their lives so that we might enjoy life today. Two thousand years ago, one perfect man gave his life that all humanity might enjoy life for all eternity. If you're trusting in Jesus, when death lands on you, it will come, not as a scary beginning or a scary end, but the beginning of life with God in heaven. It will come not as an end to life, but as the beginning of eternal life. Trust the Saviour. Submit to his rule by asking for that gift that is freely offered, but so costly to give, lest we forget. Friends, we move to a time of prayer. Let's commence our time of prayer by praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. A prayer for families, God of love and liberty. We bring our thanks today for the peace and security we enjoy. We remember those who in time of war faithfully serve their country. We pray for them and their families, and for ourselves whose freedom was won at such a cost. 
Help us to show compassion and care for those who still bear the physical and mental scars and disabilities of their service. Help us to remember the widows, girlfriends, parents and orphans, and all those who waited in vain for the return of a loved one. Make us a people zealous for peace and hasten that, that day when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither learn war any more. This we pray in the name of the one who gave his life for the sake of the world, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. And we now pray a prayer for peace. Almighty God, we remember with thanksgiving those who made the supreme sacrifice for us in times of war. We pray that their offering of their lives may not have been in vain. May your grace enable us this day to dedicate ourselves to the cause of justice, freedom and peace and give us the wisdom and strength to build a better world. Amen.
Let's wait for Let's wait for today. We come to sing our national anthem. Together we sing Australians all let us rejoice.